And we are live. Hi, Fer, how's it going? I'm good. I'm, I got, you know, I don't have chai, but I've been drinking this. Um, it's a mushroom tea, not a magic mushroom. I need to get a mug, Vitruvio mug. But uh, yes, you have your chai and I have a alternative tea to make yeah. me feel better. That's great. <laughs> How are you doing? Right. I'm doing well. I uh, finished the weekly uh, Vitruvio download and uh, we talked about doing another session here, you and I to go over with True Studio because uh, we are now at the point where we can, uh, uh, we are feature complete. And so we can show some of these features uh, to folks who may not have seen it. Uh, and I'm excited. I'm excited to to share that. So, but before we do that, uh, what's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what your experience has been working with the artists who have used it so far in, in, uh, in Alpha. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, uh, let me just first start by saying Vitru Studio is our flagship application, the main application that, that creators, artists will use to onboard and consign their artwork to uh, the chain. So, all right, with that background, tell me how it's gone so far with, uh, I, I think you have like 15 artists or so? Yes, I have about 15 that are my first alpha beta testing group so it's the really like the previous group and they're helping me like figure out like all the minor changes that we may need uh especially like because we as we build we don't have the experience of someone that is looking at it for the first time so some some things that we think that are very natural and are going to be easy like for people coming through the first time they go like you know what i think this could be you know like a, another way so it's been amazing because they love it. They're super excited to, you know, get uh, get through with the full consignment of their artwork and uh, the feedback that they have given us have been priceless. I'm super, super happy with uh, this starting group and uh, they're excited. I think the most important feedback has been on the crop tool. And nice. that is something I can't wait to show to show live for everyone to see how amazing that that is. So yeah, it's that. That's cool. <laughs> So I'm going to get my screen ready here, and uh, then we can uh, actually go ahead and uh, um, uh, start uh, uh, sharing what it's what it's like. All right. So I have everything ready here now. Um, so I think what we want to do is just kind of walk through, and as we are walking through, uh, you know, um, uh, see if anyone who joins us has questions and things like that. So let me go ahead and. Uh, share this uh, add to stage all right there we go all right so uh i think what i what we can do for is i can navigate because it's on my computer but you can talk us kind of through it and i'll jump in occasionally um i'll just have everyone know that this little symbol here it's the alpha alpha means not 100 percent awesome you know there might be bugs there might be issues etc and that's why we are doing it in a very slow and methodical manner we're not just saying here 10,000 people here's the software we're going through these different phases all right so and right now uh we have an allow list so you can't just come in and use it you have to be uh on on the genesis list and also within the genesis list uh you have to have first blessing uh, in order to, <laughs> to be able to to, to use it. Uh, all right, so I'm going to hey, go ahead. I don't have my blessing. It's just in, in, in small stages. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and log in, and this should send me a code. Uh, sometimes it takes me a little bit of time to get the code because I, 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 my email, my mailbox is too full. Uh, like I have too many emails, and so it always is a bit slow. So let's, uh, here we go. Got it. Uh, let's get that code in. Nine three five four one seven. All right, and we are in. Okay. Uh, I might zoom it, this in a little bit so it's easier to see on the stream. All right. So there we go. So uh, let's talk about the newest eye-catching innovation there on the left. For what you got going? I love it. I love it. 
So yeah, we, because of course we're artist centric, we decided that our virtual studio should have a place to showcase our artists. So we, we're starting with a handful of people that uh, I contacted directly to add their artwork. It's not, uh, let's say it's not a perk because it doesn't give you anything, but it's a place to show and celebrate you. So we have uh, on the side, uh, starting with four artists, but we're going to rotate and have more artists uh, as we grow. Right now you have my work, you have Dr. Martin, you have uh, Jeff, you have uh, the philosopher. So, uh, and the list is growing. I'm adding more as we go. Super excited to have that on the side. That's cool. All right, so shall we start with the profile and uh, then go from there? Yes. All right, so I go to profile and it's super, super straightforward here. So there's a username, and then there's an avatar. So I'll leave it at that. And why don't you talk about the right-hand side here? Yes. Um, so as we as we discussed uh, previously, and I hope that everyone paid attention to this because I think it's a very important feature, uh, you have a creator ID and not an account that is related to one wallet or one email. So you have an ID where you can add multiple emails and you can add multiple accounts. So everything is centralized into one profile for you as an artist. Uh, that will prevent you from uh, hacking problems in the future, from losing access to a certain email or things like this. So uh, the way that we have it set up for Genesis is that you must have one email to log in and one wallet connected. In the future, we're going to uh, allow people that don't have experience on Web3 to have an account, uh, a wallet that is created automatically for them. But for Genesis, we decided to go with artists that are already on Web3, and all of you have a, have an, a wallet already. So uh, you have to connect that to make sure that the contract is going to point to your wallet. Great. All right. So I already have my email. and. Uh... Uh, a wallet connected. So I'm just going to hit save and that's going to save and take us back here. So uh, this is not the final screen that people will see after our alpha is there. You're going to see your artworks and things like that as you would expect to. But this is uh, uh, this is how we, it is for for the Genesis, uh, the, the alpha. Uh, I see a few people joining out. Yeah? We have, uh, uh, and I see P Pam saying hi. Hi, Pam. Great to have you here. Uh, uh, Denise, uh, thanks for the hearts. Uh, all right, so, so shall we go to consign artwork? Yes. <laughs> well, I feel like I don't want to go to consign artwork because I feel like we ought to talk about that word consign a little bit. Oh, yes, yes. That is super important. Uh, because to get because what we should see here is mint artwork, but we don't see that. We see consign artwork. So, um, yes. I think uh, uh, let, let me just get started and then I'd like you to add the artist flair to it, you know, a little okay. bit. So I want to talk about it from an overarching perspective. Uh, what we do in Web3 art uh, today is go to a marketplace and uh, mint our art. And it's on chain and it stays on chain until you decide that, you know, maybe you've sold it or you've not sold it and you so it gets transferred or you leave it there or you burn it and these are all decisions you have to make so we decided that uh what we would like to do is mirror the real real world instead which does not work that way uh so in our world in vitruvio what we do is we have you consign the artwork and consign is a very specific meaning in the world of art right uh, like galleries have used it forever it means that i the artist, I'm giving you, in this case, Vitruvio, my artwork, I'm adding it there, uh, help me market and sell it. Uh, it's for the purpose of commerce. But I may be doing it only because I want to save it for posterity or whatever, you know? So uh, in, our, in, in Vitruvio, consign artwork means add my work to the blockchain, but uh, don't make it into some a, a token that someone can own. Uh, that's where you start. You start by consigning. Then you can make the choice of making it ownable by someone. So I'll, I'll, th that's kind of my two cents. Uh, how about you uh, speak about it from an artist's perspective? 
Okay, so I think the first the first thing that makes a huge difference in our lives as an artist is not having to choose where to consign, like in, in our case it's consign, but where to meet your artwork on a marketplace, on a blockchain and all of this. So uh, my experience so far in all these years in NFTs is that I made several mistakes choosing where to put my artwork and where to try to sell it. And then I made a, you know, like I made a, I changed my mind and I was like, okay, that doesn't work right on that marketplace. So I have to burn the, <laughs> the whole contract, all the situation and create it again in another place. Or I changed my mind. I decided that I didn't want to, you know, like sell that collection anymore. So it is a very difficult decision as an artist to choose what to do with your artwork and how to do it. So with the consign option, what we have here is uh, a window of opportunities. So you bring the artwork to one location that is your hub. So everything is placed on the heart of Vitruvio as the asset base. So everything like goes in your contract as an artist and any marketplace can pull that, inf that information after because it's not minted. It is an information that is on the blockchain that can be pulled and as a contract is pulled to buy, that's when the artwork is actually minted. So it gives us a huge opportunity as options. And that's what I love about it. That's cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the idea that you have a big pool of artworks, uh, all of them are available with different licenses, et cetera, is what's unique and different about us because it allows new use cases and new possibilities to occur. All right. So enough talk, let's go to consign artwork. Um, all right, so I've obviously used this a little bit, so I've got some progress made. Uh, so probably good to start with uh, asset media, right? The first first yeah. one. So <laughs> what we have here is a, a five-step process. And when you consign an artwork, so this is for consigning one artwork, you go through these steps. There's no hurry. You can take a day, a week, an hour, a month, whatever you need to get it done. It's going to wait for you, uh, all right? And it's very forgiving in that uh, you don't have a piece of information or something. Save your work and come back later. No problem. All right. So the five sections are asset media. So this is where you would manage all your actual files. And I say files, and you'll see why in just a minute. Uh, asset metadata. Metadata is really important. Uh, and this is something we just wrapped up actually this morning. So we are ex extremely proud to share it with you. Licenses. So Fur was just talking about how, you know, your artwork is consigned and on the blockchain until someone uses a license and says, I want the license for this and requests it. Um, it's just there. So like, you can have many different types of licenses for one artwork and not all of them require tokenization. So you don't have to create a token, for example, if you want to stream your artwork or if you want to allow someone to print it on their shirt or, I don't know, a, a bag or a hat or something. Mm -hmm. Terms of use is, is uh, legal terms. And then auxiliary media is optional stuff. So you're going to go into detail and see all of these. So let's start with asset media here. All right. So if you want to delete the original just so it shows the first page, that's what they're going to see. Yeah. All right. So this is what you're going to see. Uh, sorry, I had some data already in there. It's gone now. But you start here. And what you do is the first thing you do is you drop your artwork on here. Now, I'm not an artist. So I'm going to rely on some photos I have on my desktop. So let's go here to pics. Um, Actually, you know what? I took these photos, so I would consider them artwork, I guess. Yes, absolutely. So, so we can go with this one. This one's a funky one. All right, <laughs> cool. there we go. So it's a JPEG image, 1280 by 1006. And that's my original. So talk to me about all these panels here, Fur. Okay, so 
as an artist, we're always focused on creating that one piece of artwork that is your original art. So that's how we create, whether you're coming from the traditional industry and you have a physical piece, or if you are uh, a digital artist that creates on, on your iPad or takes a photo and they all come already in digital format. Either way, you have one artwork that is your original artwork. And that's the one you start with in this process. That's the piece that Nick has already put in there. But we are bringing to you a lot of options for uh, revenue income. So we have a few things here that are going to help you make money out of your art. One of them, which is super important, is the next one that is the display artwork. That is what goes on. A, let's see, like here behind me, I have a, I have an easel with a digital canvas. So it's exactly that format. Yeah, Nick has a horizontal format. I have the portrait. So when you upload your artwork, the first medium, it's going to recognize if you have a horizontal artwork or a portrait format or a square. And then it's going to give you the right uh, tools to go through the next steps to get all the alternative formats that we have for you to make extra income out of your artwork. So uh, the first one is the display. And what you do, you upload the very same file and it's going to, uh, if you have already cropped in your computer, if you know how to do it, you Photoshop and you get the right ratio, it's done and you upload and it's it. But if you don't have it done properly, like you upload and we have a crop tool. So you don't have to know how to use Photoshop to crop your artwork. So this is uh, Nick showing how to use the crop tool. And do you want to talk about this, Nick? <laughs> oh, you're in mute. I don't hear you. <laughs> I muted. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So my file, it turns out, is low res, but that's fine. You know, a lot of people will have that. They'll have a low res file. It was only 1280. But if you had a high res file, you could select what part of it to crop. But even if you have a low res file, you can choose which area you want to focus on and then do the crop. So that, this is a standard crop tool like anything else, but it's right there in your browser. So it becomes really, really convenient for you to use. And then you select done and boom. So you've now got this image here that conforms to um, large screens. So the 33,840 by 2160, I'll just highlight here, this part here, that's 4K resolution. That's your standard 4K resolution. And we want your artwork to look amazing. We don't want it to be showing up there with black bars or whatever. If you choose that, that's fine, but we give you the option to, to make it awesome. Uh, all right, <laughs> so that's display and then exhibition. What's that all about, Fur? Well, exhibition, uh, as you know, like you have different ways to showcase your art. If you're having uh, it in the display format, it will be like this. Someone may purchase a, a stream subscription that contains your artwork, or they may purchase your artwork and they want to showcase in a digital uh, display. So that's the format for that. It could e even be on an exhibition, but when we're doing exhibitions with the with the purpose of selling your artwork, usually you want to have some information about the art. So the format that we have for exhibitions is a ratio that allows a, a bar that is going to have your information, a QR code, anything that is needed to promote your artwork in an exhibition. So it's not very different from the from the display, but it is. Uh, an extra option to be able to have your art in a good format that will allow the overlapping of, of the information to help you sell. And again, same thing, you have the crop tool to make sure that it's going to look good in that ratio. And yeah. <laughs> cool. Done. Great. Now you can see the subtle differences between the two images. You know, the cropping does make a difference, right? Like, so this one's more, uh, uh, hasn't has less height and this one has more 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 height and then we have preview yes so preview uh if you go to um a lot of a lot of the websites that showcase a grid of all the artwork available uh our options are usually on a square format. Some websites are going to mix and match, having like all sorts of ratios. But to look nice in a grid, we chose to have a square format. So everything that is either portrait, landscape, everything is going to look the same in a square crop. 
we could have chosen to go with an automated crop, which is what happens when you upload something uh, to several platforms. That's what you know happens. It automatically crops for you, but not necessarily. It's going to choose the right area of your artwork. See, like the one that I have here behind, for instance, like when I do a crop, if it is automatically centered in the square, it's going to crop the head out. So it's not going to look good. Yeah. And because you are the artist, you know best how you want to showcase that square part of your artwork for the preview that people are going to look and then click to check on your art. So, yeah. So, of course, you know, for that, uh, that option that Nick has there, you want to make sure that you see the whole face because that's the highlight of that picture. So, yeah, nice crop. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, Joe53 asks, what about videos? Okay, videos, we have the crop tool for videos as well. And we know that a lot of video makers are more experienced and you're going to have your crop done however you want and then all you have to do is upload. But if you don't, when you upload your video, uh, you're going to be allowed to crop uh, on spot. And for the preview, we have a, a limit of five seconds, which is what we believe that looks good enough for a grid of preview so people can check your artwork and know that it's an animated piece. So uh, you're going to be able to even like, you know, choose the five seconds on your crop tool. So go videos. Like done. <laughs> yes, we love videos. <laughs> All right. OK, the last one is print and it's extremely high resolution, 12,000 by 8,000 pixels and 500 megabyte maximum. Yes. So for print, we understand that not everyone is going to have uh, a high resolution file. But we want to we want to make sure that you understand that if you want your artwork available to be printed, it has to be top quality. You can't uh, share a file that when someone puts out to print, it's going to show pixelated or you know like blurry. We can't do that if we want to show professionalism in the art industry. So that's why the print file it is optional. You you have the option to choose that as a license or not. So here you have to be very, very professional and upload a super high resolution to be able to do a beautiful canvas print or, you know, large uh, metal print or any print that someone may want to do with your work. All right. So then th this step, uh, that's an optional step, so you don't have to do it. Uh, it says this step is completed. So I'm going to click on uh, next. It's going to take me to the next step. Uh, but before we go there, I want to actually go back and show you a feature that we didn't talk about. We believe in equality. We want this um, experience and with True Studio and with Truvio to uh, make it possible for every artist to have a sustainable income through their art. Uh, what we've found in talking to thousands of artists in the space is that it's not equal, right? Mm -hmm. Folks who are fluent English speakers have a significant edge over folks who don't. Now, we've solved a lot of the problems by eliminating the need for artists to do any marketing. You know, that's the thing with Vitru Studio. You come, you upload your artwork, and you go back to your studio and you do nothing else. Uh, that's that's how Vitruvio works. But even while using this, it's very important for you to get things right and we want to make it easy. And so Vitru Studio is localized, uh, starting with five languages right now. And we'll be increasing that to other languages also. So we make it where it is available and accessible to every artist. And we want to make sure that we don't have a very sort of English-centric kind of experience. Now, it is a significant level of effort to, to do this. So we won't claim perfection, but we are going to aim for that as much as possible. You know, wherever we can, we're going to do our best. So right now, we have uh, English, Portuguese, Spanish, Farsi, and Russian. So those are the, the languages we have right now. And I'm very, very proud of this because uh, both Fafur and I, um, you know, making this accessible and available to every artist, no matter you know what their English level skills are and where they live in the world is an important thing. So uh, all right, with that done, uh, let's go to that. So this also gives me a chance to show you that 
you don't have to do all this this in one setting, right? Like I uploaded my artwork, I can go have a chai and <laughs> come back and then do the metadata. So let's go to metadata right now. Um, so uh, this is going to uh, improve more and more. What you're seeing is version 0 0.1 of the metadata. But um, it's really, really important that you have information about your artwork. And so metadata is information about your art artwork. Now, uh, we are doing something really unique here, folks. Uh, if you go and look at most other marketplaces, et cetera, where they list artworks right now, you have maybe a title, a description, keywords maybe. Uh, and some marketplaces are now uh, having additional fields. But here's the thing. They all store this information off-chain. It's not on the blockchain. So therefore, it's not searchable on the blockchain, et cetera, and it's, it's only available through a Web2 application. We wanted to change this. We wanted to make it where smart contracts could be created to interact with artworks that are on-chain based on their metadata. So all Vitruvio metadata is on-chain. So what we can do now is uh, look through. And what I'll do is I'll I'll just go through some of the fields. And for maybe you can talk about the importance of, of uh, some of these. Yes, absolutely. First, I'd like to uh, emphasize that the metadata, we're using a standard uh, format that is uh, by linked art. And that format is used by all the major museums. So we've been researching this since November last year, I have to say, or before that, before that even. Like I started researching that when we were doing art packs. Like when you first introduced me to this uh, linked art, I started researching already. But of course, like you went, you dove right, uh, you know, like much deeper into it right now to put this together. And there are some fields that are used by all those uh, institutions. And those fields are essential for you to understand and classify your artwork in a professional manner. So right now, when you go into, you know, like your foundation object, uh, you know, uh, even manifold where you have full, con uh, you know, full autonomy of how you're doing your contract, you don't have a guidance of how to do it in a way that it's professional. So we did the homework for you. We have all the fields that are important not only to help on searchability and discoverability, but to also make your artwork professional. So um, I just wanted to emphasize that because I'm, I'm thrilled about this feature. <laughs> yeah. So ultimately, metadata is going to have five sections. Uh, two of these are 100% ready. One is uh, in, in progress. By tomorrow, it'll be, it'll be done. So we're going to show you the two that account for 90% of the data. That's they are, so one is context, and the next section is taxonomy. So let's go through context. So we have some um, uh, easy fields, like we have title of work, and we have a description of work. So title is a short title of work, and description is you know a brief description of work. Now, one of the things I notice is that you know a lot of artists treat metadata as an afterthought and don't spend much time on it. We would like to change that behavior a little bit and start having artists think carefully about the metadata and put, um, you know, 15, 20 minutes into it because ultimately the metadata is going to determine if your art is even seen by someone, right? And it needs to be seen before they can make a decision to buy. So you have to think of metadata as not only, you know, uh, about providing accurate information for, for for buyers, but it's also a marketing tool. Uh, with the right information, your artwork will be more visible. All right, so then we go on to, to culture. So we have a few cultures here right now. We're going to uh, enhance them uh, a, a little bit soon. So we have, you know, what what culture is associated with your your artwork? Next. We have a field here called mood. So let's talk about that for what do you think about that? I think it's really cool. And I'll use I'll use a, a, an example because when I listen to music, I want music that is going to set a certain mood. 
So I have playlists that are associated to a certain mood. For me, it would be amazing if I selected, I want a cheerful playlist today, you know, and that goes the same for artwork. If I want to have a streaming of art, I want to set a certain mood to that day or to the event or whatever, you know, like uh, I feel like in that moment. So mood is a very, very cool uh, extra feature that I think is going to make amazing on playlists. So super excited about this. Yeah, and uh, we are working through the finalization of the, the choices that are, are here. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to ask, like, well, can you allow us to put custom sort of data in there? What we're going to do is we're going to hold off on that a little bit because we want standardization. And so if a lot of people enter different words, et cetera, what we will have is a, a, a lot of one you know, uh, a result of one. And what we want is to make it easier for buyers to, to find your work. And so we're going to stick with the uh, existing uh, standard fields for, for right now and deal with outliers a, a little later. All right, so after mood, the next thing that comes is colors. So think of this as the color palette. Uh, that feature is not uh, there yet, but we are going to auto detect it for you. So we already see your artwork, right? We will auto detect. But for right now, for this alpha, you have to manually provide us what the color palette is and just tell us uh, what it is. Uh, you can you can do it in, in hex. You can do it in RGB, HSV, et cetera. And you can increase this palette to as much as you want. But we are going to ask you for at least three. And I believe we are going to limit it to three also. So it might, it might be a, a fixed thing. So oh, I didn't click the thing there. So here we go. <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, yep. So, and like I said, we will auto de detect and you can then customize and tweak it uh, if you wish. All right. So that's your color palette. And uh, then we move on to copyright. Now, copyright here is not about licensing or anything like that. This is simply what copyright text do you want to appear whenever someone sees this? So uh, you can you can say whatever you want here. You know, typically it will, it will be something like copyright X Y Z, all rights reserved, or something like that. This is again not licensed. You can leave it blank if you wish, and it'll be a, there'll be a default one uh, created for you. And then uh, finally, uh, orientation. Again, we will auto detect it for you. Uh, in this case, it's horizontal, uh, but uh, we give you the option on some of these fields. Uh, the metadata will be auto detected and you can see it, but you can't change it because it's uh, it, it's deterministic. You know, like the fact that the artwork is horizontal is not up for debate. It's you uploaded <laughs> the file and we can see it. <laughs> it's what so, it is. <laughs> so, uh, Lord IP asked a question about so not CC0, CC1, etc. Hold that thought because we're going to come to it very soon, and your question will be answered. But but yeah, in this case, you just it's just a plain text line. All right. Next, we go on to taxonomy. Now, uh, here what we've done is given some context for your artwork, right? It's very it's almost like softball stuff, right? Mood, uh, colors, uh, orientation, etc. But now we get into the really important and um, significant classification. So the first thing is we categorize your artwork, right? Is it digital? Is it physical? Or, or is it digital and physical? Like, uh, is this like maybe a scan of, of something, et cetera? So I'm going to say digital here. Uh, and then next, we have tags. So there's a tag that's auto-generated for you, but you can remove it. Uh, the idea behind tags is uh, the same as it always has been on social media, et cetera, is to create a loose sort of, uh, they, they used the term folksonomy. It's gone out of style now. But uh, yeah, so my picture was taken in Dubai. So I'll put that. Uh, I will put um, microphone. That's a, that's it was visible uh, in there. And I'll put um, graffiti. Right? So those are some of my tags. You can enter as many as you want. Next comes collections. Now, uh, in present day marketplaces, you start with a collection, you add your artwork to it. We don't feel that that constraint should exist. You should have your artwork in as many collections concurrently as you wish. 
And so you can do that. You can create as many collections as you wish. So I'm going to uh, call my collection here street photos. And maybe I have one that I call graffiti also. But uh, these are virtual buckets. Your collections are um, view, your, your artworks are viewable through many different lenses, shall we say? And a collection is one, a tag is one. So if someone goes and selects a tag graffiti, your artwork is going to show up there because you've added that tag there. If someone wants to browse your collection called graffiti, they can do that and they can see that. If someone wants to browse all collections on Vitruvio that are called graffiti, because you have one like that, you can see that also. So it's very flexible, uh, both horizontally and vertically. It can go as, as much as you wish. All right, next comes uh, a question that is a, a designed to um, uh, deal with the controversy of people posting artwork for sale that is completely AI generated, but then they are saying it's theirs. So uh, we make it clear in the agreement that you will see soon uh, that we want to be upfront. We want artists to be honest about it. There is nothing wrong with AI art. It is a form of art, but it should not be deceptive. You should be clear to the buyer. And so we ask the question, is any part of this work AI generated? And we don't want uh, a lot of these questions that are actually not black and white, like they're not yes, no answers to be that way. Wanna, we want to give you the flexibility to answer truthfully. So it's fully AI generated. It's partially AI generated or no AI was used. So for your comments on this. Yes, um, I have to give a personal example again, because I do love AI and um, I think it's important to be very clear about it. So uh, I'm a painter and I do a lot of uh, like people, like I paint people. So most of the time I photograph myself to actually do an artwork. And with AI, that changed my life dramatically. So for instance, that image that I have behind, which is one of the pictures that keeps showing on the left, that one, um, I could not have photographed myself jumping to paint based on that photo because it's super complicated. It's fun though. <laughs> I can do that today. <laughs> Absolutely. But anyway, like I use AI nowadays to create a reference to start from. So I generate those images on Mid Journey and then I select the area that I want my paint based on those images. So yes, I use AI. It's not a fully generated AI piece, but I have AI in it. So I think it's important to clarify and uh, as Nick said, AI is not a problem. Like we love AI, but we want people to be upfront about it. If you use AI, some people are very averse to AI. So you can't, you can't be deceptive on this. Like if you say that you painted and you didn't even touch a brush, it's, it's bad. You know, you, you should be very clear about the use of AI in your artwork. Yep. All right, then moving on, next question is about nudity. Does this work contain nudity or it does not contain nudity? This is just so that uh, when there are streams and things like that that are showing up in people's living rooms or whatever, they might not want to have nudity show up. And so we have that clear. We'll probably, just like AI, also make this more granular. So it can say that, you know, it's, uh, how should I say, tasteful uh, versus uh, more, uh, more on the erotic side of things. Uh, all right. Next come uh, a series of fields that are designed to uh, help you uh, really uh, help you help buyers decide, you know, what your artwork is about. So the medium. So, you know, in all of these, we use a plural because we find that uh, people mix things, right? They, it's it, That's creativity. You know, you, you break the mold. It's not like it has to be done with only one thing. People go do multiple things. And we want you to be able to express that. So mediums here are, uh, you know, lots of different mediums are available. And uh, we try to be fairly exhaustive in these. So there is no doubt in my mind that you will come up with something that is not on the list, you know, <laughs> and we'll deal with that. But for right right now, we are gonna, we're going to stick. It's not even the Pareto 80-20 rule. I think it's like the 99 
1% rule or whatever. 99% will be covered by uh, all the choices uh, that we have here. And I'm I'm hoping that no one in the audience throws up a comment here saying, hey, Nick, I just, this is not in there right now. And they <laughs> just bust my bubble right away. Uh, but yeah, we've, we've tried to be fairly exhaustive on this. Next is, uh, so that's mediums. And then is style. So what are the styles that I used? And generally, this would be only one. But you know, I can see hybrid artworks all the time where people are mixing uh, mixing different different styles. So they might do pop art, but then they might, I don't know, uh, throw throw uh, some traditional canvas painting on top of it or something. Uh, but but that's fine, right? This is art. It's fun. You should be able to do whatever you want to, and we want to be able to communicate that through metadata. The next is subject. Now this year is guaranteed not to please everyone because there's you know, an infinite number of subjects possible. What we are trying to capture here is sort of common sort of categories of it. And um, the purpose of our alpha is also to refine these lists. We will continue to uh, grow, go to standards as much as possible. You know, uh, So next is materials. So we have lots of different materials here. Uh, we also um, try and make it where, uh, again, these are all standard-based uh, lists, so in compliance with linked art uh, uh, standard. So we'll get the vocabulary. Now, for those of you who don't know Getty, uh, the, the stock photo site, but also the museum, they are sort of the world's keeper of vocabulary. So if you go to the Getty website, you'll find lots of information there about different art vocabularies and, and things like that. So as you can see, the material list is pretty exhaustive. It's going on and on and on and on. So uh, this is what I meant earlier, like take 15 minutes, you know? Uh, I mean, you know what materials are there. You don't have to spend all day on, on this. You know, it's just checking a few boxes. Like it's a watercolor, it's a watercolor, you're done. Uh, you know, <laughs> but if it's something more specific or whatever, take the time and, and communicate that, uh, all right. So that's it on, uh, on, on the metadata on the two sections that we have currently. Uh, as I mentioned, the creator section is something that we'll get done here in the next day. And uh, that is where we will pause metadata for a bit. We'll spend some time refining. Um, so now let's go back to the main task list and look at some of the other things which are important. So go ahead and hit save. Uh, this is not going to let me do this because I didn't in enter all the information. So I said no, and I lost my information, but that's OK. I was just doing demo stuff anyway. All right, so now we come to licenses. All right, so here's where uh, you need to understand how the relationship is between consignment and licenses. So a consignment is your artwork on chain. End of story. Uh, you put it on there, and it's available for you or for anyone to look at. That's it. That's all you can do with consignment, is look at it. You, as the artist, have to explicitly give permission for a third party, meaning me or fur or someone else, to do something with your artwork. And with Vitruvio, you have the power to choose exactly what you want done with your artwork. So for example, if you want people to be able to print your art on t-shirts, but not mint NFTs, you can do that. Conversely, if you want people to only mint NFTs, but not print your art on shirts, you can do that. Or maybe you want both. Let's look at licenses, because ultimately, commerce happens when someone consumes a license you have created. So you create licenses, and someone consumes them. So let's go look at that. All right, so we have a number of different types of licenses. I'm going to uncheck all of these. I should have done that before. Uh, let's do that. All right, here we go. All right, so uh, for how do you want to do this? You want me to just start off talking and you jump in with comments? Yeah, go ahead. Like you, you, you're very good at explaining this. So yeah. all right. So <laughs> as I mentioned, uh, you know, licenses are uh, there for you as an artist to grant to people. And if you see the licenses here are all have a suffix, they have a number, a one. What that should tell you is that we intend to have many different versions of licenses. In fact, I predict that by the time we are a year into this, there's going to be maybe you know 20 different types of NFT licenses and all that. Because we want to give you granularity in what 
permissions you give people. And the same artwork should be available with multiple licenses. So this is where I want to clear up a point of confusion. Many artists who understandably are not familiar with the law, copyright law, et cetera, you know, you're artists, I get that, right? But we want to educate and help you. Uh, when you create an artwork, you hold the copyright for it automatically. That is common law. That is established. When you grant someone a license to do something, you do not relinquish your copyright to it. You still have the ability to license that artwork in other ways, unless you happen to create a license where you explicitly give up rights. And trust me, most people don't do that. You know, you don't want to do that. Why, why are you going to give up your rights? Keep your rights. So when someone buys your NFT of your artwork, it hasn't changed the fact that you can now still uh, license your artwork for uh, a, for streaming or for printing or anything like that, right? And that's what this is designed to do. So we have started off with four licenses and we'll add more along the way. So what you do is you check and enable the license that you want. So the first one is NFT art. And it says here, this license makes the artwork available for sale under one of several edition pricing models. When sold, an NFT of the artwork is minted and delivered to the buyer. So this is very important. No minting occurs until someone pays money. Until then, your artwork is already on the blockchain, but it isn't minted as a token, all right? So we are advocating for the use of uh, editions because we have a unique feature called elastic editions. Let's look at how that works. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you do is you choose the, the license and when you enable it, you get to choose which type of license you have. And so, so Lord, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, Lord IP, Lord IP, um, here's where you get to choose the type of license. And uh, maybe I think this was working, but uh, it's, it's broken. When you click on I, it takes you to the detailed uh, uh, information about the type of license. So these are all Creative Commons standard licenses used by YouTube and other companies, and we want to make it super easy. Now, notice here on the bottom, there's a Vitruvia option. We are in the process of working with our lawyers to create the very best, most balanced uh, artist and buyer art license that's that's possible, that's fair, and takes care of you know standard use cases. So for example, if I bought an NFT of your artwork, um, it would be great if you allowed me to print one t-shirt or something like that as part of it, you know? It, uh, things like that, or, or you allowed me to show it in multiple locations in my home. Uh, you know, I'm not con constrained to having it only in my browser or in my wallet or something like that. So we want to be explicit about it and and uh, make it very balanced and artist and buyer friendly. All right, so let's start at the bottom here, unlimited editions. So this just means it's an open mint, basically, that's what you call it. Give it a price, so, you know, um, well, Let's see, let's say $500, boom, you know, or, or it's it's maybe 100 more affordable. My art is not that good. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, unlimited editions or a single edition. So in which case, you know, uh, well, maybe I, I charge 500 here. All right. But we put elastic editions first because we feel like that is going to be the best way for you to get sales without compromising anything. So what's Elastic Editions? So Elastic Editions is where you, as an artist, say, what is the income you want to derive from this artwork, right? So let's say that I want to uh, derive $500 from this artwork, right? So, or let's say actually $1,000, so just to keep, keep the math uh, easier. So I'm gonna put a $50 price and I'm gonna say 20 editions. What does that give me? $1,000. What did I say I wanted it to be 5,000? Or a thousand? Yes, I think it was five thousand. Yeah. I said five thousand. Okay, let's let, let's change it and keep it a thousand. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't want to just confuse yeah. everyone. Okay, uh, th this is what happens when you don't sleep. Um, okay, so now I'm saying I have fifty editions available. Uh, sorry, 50, 20 editions available for a price of fifty each, and I want to give an edition discount of two percent. All right, what this means is when a buyer comes 
to your artwork and likes it, they can add multiple editions and combine them as one unit by paying the multiplied price. So if I come to your artwork and I want 10 editions, I would pay 10 multiplied by 50, 500, but you check the 2% discount here. So each, each uh, one above one is discounted 2%. So I can't do the math in my head, but the Vitruvio store will do that for, for you. So what it does is immediately compress, lower the number of editions because the multiple editions that someone buys are considered one unit. And so that's the elastic part. So if first already bought one of yours, and I come along and see that there are 19 available and they are $50 each and I love your artwork, I can buy all 19 and you have received your $1,000 because, you know, that's how the math works. But your artwork is sold as uh, an edition size of two because Fur got one and I got one. So that's elastic editions. And we believe that every artist, if they do this, they give the buyers a choice and let the market do its work for you. Why, why do you want to dictate things? Now, if you are completely sold on the fact that it must be singular, there should not be two versions of that, that's fine. You can do that too. But if your objective is to make money and keep moving your artwork, you would want to choose Elastic Editions because it allows people, especially people like me, like I'm a collector and when I go in and see editions, I'm like, I want to just buy all of them. And I have to go through like 50 transactions. And I do that sometimes when I really want it. But man, oh man, I would want to just go like, give me all of these at one shot, you know, and be done. So Elastic Editions is that. All right. Uh, any comments on, on that, uh, Fur? No, I'm just going to say that uh, I absolutely love this option. And it is funny because as, um, as an artist, we don't realize how some collectors like you would want to buy out a set. And even though like I've seen you do it several times, like we, we have a hard time understanding that it can happen. So we focus too much on, you know, like, is this going to be good for a one of one? Is this going to be good for, uh, you know, like a several edition? What, where am I going to make money out of this? So it is amazing to have this option. And also like, I think uh, I gave a, I gave a, um, a workshop on pricing and I think I have to circle back on this because some artists don't understand exactly how to price their artwork so I see some people pricing differently if they're if they're doing a one of one or if they're doing additions where there shouldn't be a difference there you know like your artwork is worth a certain amount of money because it's worth your time doing this it's worth the expenses that you put on that so there is a value to that one artwork you created whether it has been done to be a one of one or additions that is the same value so people should understand this so it makes it easier once they understand that concept that elastic editions is a, a, a very, like amazing solution yeah so a couple of questions here so price on the 19 and one artwork would be 19 times uh, a single price. Yeah, exactly. It's just straight up math, except the discount. So if you've checked the discount option, then uh, each subsequent copy would be discounted 2%. And so you get slightly less money, but you also favor the buyer and make it uh, you know, enticing for them to buy it. And I totally get it that the first person paid, you know, got a killer deal right a killer price on their one edition but that's up to the buyer let them decide you know if they don't care they don't care you know so uh yeah uh elastic is such a great option thank you we we think so and we hope that uh, uh you uh more people will will use it absolutely could we also have a system that find that one from the 20 so the buyer of one can sell it Ooh, that's interesting oh, that's a good yeah. feature yeah, we go track it down and say, dude, give it to me and merge it into a one of one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in interesting. Now, in my experience, I've found that people are extremely reluctant to do that. They hold on. And in fact, the moment you ask them, even if they didn't care about their artwork, now they start caring about it. You know, <laughs> So uh, it might it might be tough, but that's a good su suggestion. I'm going to make a note of it. Uh, by the way, uh, while Fur was talking about pricing, uh, I, I did 
mention forgot to mention one thing that we are going to build in here that's going to come later uh it's not going to come right away is because we're going to have this pool of artworks uh we can give you pricing guidance we can say that okay the metadata you have selected is xyz your artwork is you know uh so and so we can do an ai analysis of it and tell you based upon the artworks we see and you know uh what you're doing here this is approximately what you might consider selling the artwork for so yeah we can we can do that uh all right so it would be great perhaps in the future to implement dynamic nfts uh congrats for all the artwork yeah thank you yes we absolutely are uh uh in, in fact you will see here later that how we have factored in dynamic nfts so all right let's continue um let's go to my favorite topic and i'm very sorry folks but i'm going to be talking for two and a half hours now no i'm just kidding <laughs> i will not but streaming artwork all right look we studied the market we studied the market and we saw why so many artists are struggling i mean that's all in you know, artists are always struggled but specifically in web3 they're struggling because it's a very constrained model. It basically is a one and done model. You mint an NFT and you hope who hope you find a buyer for it somewhere of all the buyers out there. Um, but that's, that's, that's throwing darts at a target. That's like, I don't know, a hundred meters away or a hundred feet away or whatever you, you, you want to use, you know, the chances that they're going to hit are pretty slim. What we want to do is increase your chances of winning. And the way to increase your chances of winning is to expose your artwork to as many people as possible while at the same time having you make money. And the answer to that is streaming. So Vitruvio is committed to being the Spotify of art. Uh, we are already in talks with display panel vendors. We want to create subscription offerings where curated playlists of artworks are available for living rooms, hotels, offices, airports, hospitals, you name it. And what you get out of this is passive recurring income. Your artwork is out there. All you have had to do is check this box and say, I want to make my artwork available for streaming. Now, you are not going to be able to dictate terms of pricing and things like that, at least for version one. For version two, you might be able to say that I only want it when, you know, the projected uh, uh, unit price per stream would be X, Y, Z, et cetera. So, but initially it's, we, we're just building this, right? We, we are trying to come up with what the subscription packages are for streaming and all that. I certainly have, you know, I have units like this all over my home. I would have subscriptions, all of them. So I can choose very granularly. This is the kind of artwork I want to see. I can choose the repeat frequency so I can say that, look, I don't want to see the same artwork twice in one day, you know, <laughs> or I can say I don't want to see it twice in, in six hours or whatever. And because there is a global pool of infinite artwork, we can match your requirements. So the way this will work is it'll be a, a post, uh, your payment will be post uh, uh, sales. In other words, the month occurs, the art has been streamed, we'll do the audit on, this is all on smart contracts, by the way. This is not happening in our database or something. It's all on chain. And whatever that is determined gets gets paid to you. Uh, speaking of which, uh, uh, we are uh, creating a system where every creator uh, has an ID on our system. We call it true ID. And we're gonna talk about that in, in another session. But associated with every true ID is a contract. So your smart contract. So every one of your artworks, no matter when you uh, consign it, if there is any activity on it, any monetary activity, the funds for it go into the contract and they sit there. And this is very important. Lots of artists get their wallets hacked and then they lose ownership of their assets and they lose their funds. With the contract approach, it's safe because your contract will have a built-in, what we call multi-signature, multi-sig capability. So you need to have at least two accounts in there, two wallets in there, but we prefer you have more. And you need 
at least two of those to approve anything, whether you're withdrawing funds or you're adding a new license or something like that, you need multiple of your wallets. So if some hacker gets possession of one of your wallets, go to your true ID, delete that, consider it bye-bye, add a new wallet, and you are in business. You, If you had some money in there, you might have lost it, but your assets, uh, ownership is unquestionably not, not an issue. Uh, your funds from your contract that are sitting there uh, that you may not have claimed yet are not an issue. They are safe. So this will be very safe for artists. Uh, okay. So next one is print art. So uh, I will take a break and let you explain this one first. Okay, so um, as we mentioned before about the quality of your uh, file for printing, it's super important because you're going to allow the option for people to print your artwork in uh, several different formats. We're starting with a super simple license that is one print no matter in what surface. So that's to start with, and we expect that uh, at this point it will be more like you know you want a T-shirt or maybe like a, a small print on a paper or something something simple. Uh, as we evolve and we close on some partnerships with uh, proper you know like uh, uh, companies that do several different options of uh, sizes of print like metal print or any of this, then we can have a more elaborate uh, type of license where the number is going to be based on what the person is going to use it for but to start with we're going with a very simple you want to allow someone to do one print that's the value that you put in there and they use it to anything that they want great so you can i can print your artwork for my car uh, yes <laughs> have fun <laughs> all right <clears throat> so the next one is a remix art license so we are have a partnership with uh, Lens Post, which is essentially a Canva for Web3. And by checking this license, you enable people to use your artwork in memes and things like that and get paid for it. So some people might consider that sacrilege. My art is amazing and mine, and I will not allow it to be used in silly, ridiculous memes. But uh, some people might say that, yeah, you know, why not? It'll be fun. You know, I'll make some money and uh, people can can make memes out of it. So it's your choice. Again, all of these are are check check marks. You can check none of these. And guess what? Your art is still on the blockchain. Your art is still searchable. It shows up in results, etc. But people can't uh, uh, commercially transact uh, with it. All right. So uh, question here. Can a license be changed later on if it gets popular? So it depends, right? Uh, it depends on if, for example, if it's an NFT license where you have an addition price, et cetera, set, then you probably don't want to be able to change that midstream. But uh, all these other things, yeah, you can change them anytime you want. Like Because the print license, for example, applied to the people who printed up to that point, And now you saw that, oh, wow, it's very popular. Go ahead and go change it uh, and uh, increase it. Because um, everything is at a point in time, right? So when someone is transacting and requests a print license, they're going to get a snapshot of what is the license, what are the license terms at that point in time, and they have to abide uh, by that. So so yeah, you can, uh, when, when your artwork, uh, when you have that super hit uh, thing, you can change your price from $1 to $100 and, and make a killing. If, uh, because, uh, yeah, absolutely. So we got Remix, we got uh, Print, etc. all of those. All right, let's go on. Uh, just a few more sections, and then we are done. I'm sorry it's taken a long time, but we have worked hard on this to make it really comprehensive and address all the problems that we've encountered that we are aware of. So now comes the terms of use. So we've got a simple creator agreement. Uh, People can take this apart and look at it, and there is nothing in here uh, that says anything about Vitruvia owning your art or anything like that. There's none of that uh, because, uh, you know, first of all, this is a, a a a blockchain for creators. This is your blockchain, right? We are not going to put ridiculous terms in here that are designed to to hurt artists. All all this says is that 
you give us the right to use your preview image basically to sell your artwork you know that's what it comes down to uh, you retain like you'll see that again and again the the creator retains all all rights for everything the only thing that we put here is because we still have to live in a world where we have to comply with uh, with the law uh, we would take down your artwork from the websites you know where but it is still on chain and it that is impervious that cannot that cannot be removed or taken down or anything like that so um all this this means is that we we will basically stop it from showing up in search results but otherwise uh if if and, and that's because someone complained you know that you infringed on something so we'll go through due process on that and not just arbitrarily do do things uh but here are three check mark questions that are important i hereby agree that the asset and auxiliary media files are original authentic works that have been created by the creators indicated in the metadata submission and not copied stolen or plagiarized from any other source so we just want you to be be uh, straight up honest about it you know what's funny um there is a form where the irs uh, there's a field where it says report here your earnings from theft drug sales etc or something <laughs> and i'm like what who came up with that who the heck is going to report that but that is really really funny but they actually have that in a form where like income from from theft <laughs> you know stolen goods like what it's funny um I hereby agree that if any portion of the asset and auxiliary media files were created using artificial intelligence, I have answered yes to the metadata field for AI generation. So here, going back to the metadata, you're saying that, yep, I agree that if there was any AI on it, and I hereby agree that this work is not minted on any other blockchain, or offered, consigned, or listed for sale on any other platform, and will not be minted, offered, consigned, or listed as long as a listing is active on this platform. So you're free to come back and revoke a, a license and say that, okay, I'm gonna keep this on chain, but I'm not making it available with a license. Because remember, we are doing the marketing and promotion and sales for you. You are no longer responsible for doing that. So if you are actively selling that on another chain, that poses a serious problem because uh, we can't be s s selling um, it in a, in, in, in a certain license when there might be a parallel license that is um, in con conflict, right? So we just want you to agree to that. That's that. Okay. Um, and then last but not the least is auxiliary media. So this was my uh, pet kind of section. I put it there because uh, I really want artists to start looking beyond the standard uh use case of the artwork itself is value i get that totally i don't want a bunch of messages from people saying hey my i don't, I don't need to do anything to my artwork to make it amazing no i'm not saying everyone has to do it but we also want this space to move forward and be innovative and come up with radically new and exciting ways in which people can experience art and for that we need auxiliary media what does that mean well by default Every artwork that is consigned uh, is augmented reality enabled. So we will soon be releasing a web-based viewer and you can look at your art, uh, whether it's on a screen or it's printed on a shirt or I don't know, you got a tattoo of it, you scan, you scan, even the tattoo, if you scan it, it will work and you will see augmented reality content. So here you get to choose uh, uh, not choose really you get to upload an image and or a video um that will be displayed when the um uh, uh the, the the augmented reality scan is made we'll improve this along the way we will allow you to create more interactive experiences 3d this that etc but we'll start with two things uh, 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 an image and a video next uh we plan on doing a lot of marketing promotion for you and we thought it would be great for you to provide us with a BTS image and a BTS video so we could use that in, in promotions and also make it available to the buyers uh, of your artwork, et cetera, so they can see how that amazing artwork came to, to life. And finally, 
code zip. We want to enable new and exciting use cases of interactive, engaging, dynamic, experiential art. So we will be uh, publishing script, script libraries ourselves because there's a lot already done in that uh, realm. Uh, but here, you can upload your assets. So JavaScript, HTML, CSS, JPEGs, GIFs, SVGs. You can just put them all in a zip and upload the interactive uh, artwork. And uh, uh, right now, we're going to start off small. So we're not going to unleash any of that on you. But believe me, this feature is there because we want we want everyone to be able to create an artwork you know, that changes according to the season or the time of day or, I don't know, the temperature or Bitcoin price or whatever it is that you, you want, external signals. Um, or it can even change. Uh, the, the one I'm particularly excited in is, is if you have additions, the artwork changes and unlocks new features as more additions are sold. So things start appearing and the artwork gets increasingly more elaborate cool. uh, you know, as more are sold. So for example, initially you have a scene of a person sitting on a bench. Uh, artwork two is sold and now a person appears on the bench next to them in everybody's artwork. Three is sold, and now there's a, a, a couple making out in the background. Four is sold, and there's a person playing with the puppy in the background in the park or whatever. You know, so this experiential art like increases as more editions are, are sold. So that's just one 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 idea. But there there are many other scenarios we can unlock uh, that we are excited about for 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 this. All right, so that is it. The grand tour of uh, Vitru Studio Basic Edition. Super <laughs> basic. We haven't unlocked a ton of features that we have in store uh, right now, but we start somewhere, right? We start with the basic, and 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 uh, and uh, we are really proud of it. It's been a labor of love, and I'm hoping artists will will take advantage of it. What do you say, Fur? I want to say that I am over the moon with this uh i can't i can't say how much of being anxious to deliver this to our our community because we've been working on this as a concept for so many months <laughs> and it's like it's amazing to finally see it coming together you know like and ready to be used so uh, i wanted to comment something for the artists that look at this and think it's a little bit overwhelming uh because a lot of a lot of people may think, oh my God, there's so much information on metadata. But know that all of that is in the metadata available to actually make it work for you. It's not for us, you know, like we want you to have success with your artwork. And even if you're minting, like for instance, uh, consign in this case, like I have, I have an exhibition, there was a museum show, it had 42 pieces and I have been thinking about putting that in the blockchain for um, two and a half years, three years that it's been on my mind. And I was like, I don't know exactly where to put it because I wanted it to be something that would actually give the information of my artwork properly. And there was no no situation that I could do this. So now with, with the metadata structure that we have, I feel super confident that I can finally have my museum collection on the blockchain for posterity. So I'm, I'm over the moon with the feature to be able to catalog the art properly and show it professionally online. So this is this is amazing. Yeah, what, so the one of the features that we will bring up uh, at, you know, after we've gone through the initial pilot, et cetera, is uh, ingestion, artwork ingestion at scale, right? So we want, we want museums, we want galleries with 100,000 artworks to just like uh, get them get them on here uh, very easily, uh, use automation to grab metadata, etc., and uh, really uh, get them all uh, consigned. This notion of having your artwork on chain is an interesting one uh, because to date the actual artwork cannot reside on the blockchain because it's cost prohibitive to do that because we own the protocol when i say own i mean we have control of the protocol uh, one of the things the directions we want to take it is also start extending the protocol uh, which is ethereum compatible uh, to ingest uh, 
and actually put the media uh, on chain over time. So, you know, storage costs keep decreasing over time, but it's still decentralized and it's a blockchain. And if you want to secure the blockchain, you need lots of validators. And not every validator is going to have, like, I don't know, a 500 terabyte storage thing or whatever that's more expensive for, for them. But uh, this is a problem that there are a few solutions being kicked around in the world and some have been implemented also. And we are very committed to it. So your idea of having your artwork uh, on chain for posterity will be, be true. For right now, a reference about it will be there. The metadata will be on chain. Uh, and one of the things that I was thinking of to start is, so what if you can't have the whole um, uh, artwork on chain? Maybe you could downsample it and put a low res version of it, uh, at least, uh, you know? Or uh, one of the things that we can start off with is fingerprinting. So we can fingerprint your artwork. Uh, fingerprint is a term that basically means, you know, do a digital analysis of it and come up with a digital string, uh, you know, a set of values that uniquely identify that that uh, artwork. That's how Face ID works, by the way. When you when you do Face ID, it's not like looking like, hey, uh, you know, are you looking handsome today or not? It doesn't do that. It's looking at <laughs> It's measuring, it's measuring distances, right, between your eyes. It's measuring contours and all of that. So that can be done with an artwork also, and it's called fingerprinting. It's already done. It's already done with sound, by the way. Uh, when you go to a bar or whatever, uh, the audio that's being emitted uh, already has uh, ultrasonic sound in it that you cannot hear, but it's there for the purpose of fingerprinting. So we'll do that to art also. Uh, and I'm not talking about steganography here, which is where you hide you hide information, you know, within an artwork. We actually uh, use algorithms to create a fingerprint uh, of the artwork. So what that means is it is a, a a step stone to getting your artwork fully on the blockchain because you start off with getting a replica of it on there. So, so yeah, uh, yes, Shazam for for music. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, so anyway, folks. So this is it. This is uh, Studio. We are. Uh, now alpha feature complete. Uh, the 15 artists are gonna get a go at the metadata, etc. Upload all that. Uh, then Fur uh, will decide. Uh, she has uh, set up a website where uh, you can donate funds, and the people donating the highest funds will get in <laughs> first. No, I'm just kidding. There is no such site. Fur is very fair and wants. Um, wants the the best artists the ones who are most excited and uh devoted to to this concept uh to be there i i once again emphasize i was just kidding for does not want your money uh so uh yeah so we are going to uh i think it's going to be an amazing march it's going to be an amazing amazing march where we start and and we want to accelerate right if things go well with these first 15 30 40 then we'll open the faucet very fast and they just start onboarding people. Now, I want you guys to know one very important thing, okay? And not all artists know this. So here you go. Yesterday, we concluded our booster sale. So boosters were NFTs that we sold for $150 each that gave the investors uh, Vitru coins, uh, a share of sales revenue of the artworks, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, by the way, um, when an artwork is sold, we charge the buyer, not the artist. We charge the buyer 2% additional, we, so we bump up the price. So anyway, here's one thing you ought to know about these boosters. We sold 10,116 of them. Each of these boosters has a collector credit of $150. What that means is that the first approximately 10,000 artworks, depending on the price of them, you know, like if, if they are 150 bucks, then it's one unit. If it's more than that, it might be two units or whatever, are already waiting with buyers. Like th these booster holders have a credit. They can go to the Vitru store we set up, find an artwork they like and hit buy. It takes their credit and it pays you in real Vitru. So... Uh, we have pre-sold approximately $1.5 million of uh, 
artworks already. So the artists that come on board first, you know, get that. Now, I don't know what the pricing will be. I know for a fact that we will discourage artists from going at the the scraping the bottom prices. We don't want that. We want fair prices, you know, that whether that's, you know, $1,000, $500, $200, or $10,000. I don't know. The market will decide that. But on Vitruvio, we want artists to get a fair value, you know, for, for their artworks. And we're going to encourage that by making sure that we line up a lot, a lot of buyers. So again, you know, significant number of booster buyers already lined up for uh, buying. Uh, so can I still buy boosters? Nope, the the, the sale ended yesterday, uh, but uh, we, uh, let me refresh. Yeah, it's, but you can go to the OTC page and you can buy Vitru uh, directly. So that is still available. Uh, all right, so this was our journey today. It was, wow, we've been on for one hour and 20 minutes. I did not realize that. Oh my God. <laughs> um, yes, yeah. it's, it's so, been, we had a lot to talk about. So it's, yeah, it's this the first time we did a reveal, right? In public, uh, we've, we, I've showed slides and all that before, but first time we showed interactive software. Yeah. So Pam asks, is there a secondary market? Uh, can you clarify, Pam? Are you talking about art or are you talking about Oh, artwork, I believe. Different. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like first first thing that um, we have to we have to clarify is that people buy like in any marketplace, they buy and they sell. So we are going to have a store and people can buy and sell. What we are looking into here is setting up more in the sense of people that actually appreciate art, not so much on flipping art. So, of course, there's always going to be a secondary market and we want to make sure that the artists are going to be protected in that. So you have the royalty set in your contract. It's not going to be taken by the marketplace. It's by your original contract. So all of this is like we're looking after you, but we want to onboard collectors that actually love art. If you look at uh, Nick's wallet and most of mine, I did, a, I did a few flips just to buy more art. So I flipped a few memes but we buy because we love art we're not buying to flip so that's th with that mindset is that someone like nick will go and buy out the editions because he loves the artwork and he wants to make sure that you know like he wants that edition sold out for the artist so secondary market is always going to be available but we want real art appreciators and that will come with the credit card, this is something I'm super excited. Um, we have the vision of onboarding people that are not yet on Web3. So uh, I have a lot of friends that uh, see me posting about this. They have not yet been on the, on the Web3 uh, industry because they think it's super complicated. So we are introducing a super easy process where someone buys with a credit card, they don't have to have a wallet. Like right now, if you buy uh, on credit card in some other platforms, you still have to have a wallet. You buy with money, but it goes to your wallet. And we want to make sure that it's a seamless experience. And with that, uh, you know, we're going to get serious art collectors coming into the space, experiencing having art in their homes. I'm super excited about this. <laughs> yeah. And also we are throwing out the window the notion of a marketplace per se, because what we are doing is creating essentially a model uh, where there's a store uh, which has all the, you know, what you would expect in a store, but it's really a, a Shopify model. So you can come and say file, well, not file, you can say new store, create new store. And you can say, I want to sell a subset of this kind of artwork, et cetera, set it up and uh, add how much money you want to make, like what is your upsell? Uh, and that's it. Then you're responsible for promoting that store, but we handle all the tech uh, for you because all the art is already on chain. Uh, the software will be the same thing that our store uses. It's just branded according to you. And so maybe maybe you you like, uh, I don't know, uh, you you like uh, elephants, right? So you can have a, you can have in the metadata, you can put keyword elephant and maybe you only want photos. So you can select digital photographs or whatever, and you can create a store that sells black and white photos of, of elephants, elephants, you know, and mark it, mark it up 20%. And there you go. The artist makes their money. You make 20%, uh, 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 we make 2%, and everyone is happy. 
So that's that's um, the model we're creating. Just oh, before before you wrap up, just because you touched on price and it's something that people get very uh, very anxious about it. So when the artist sets the price on the license, that is the price the artist is going to get. No commission is taken out of your price. You know, your cut is your cut in full. And then we have the 2% on top. Of course, we have to run the, the whole blockchain. It has to run on something. Uh, so we cover gas, for instance. Like we, we're making sure that it's run by success and not taken out of the, you know, like of the weekend, as I like to say it. So we want to make sure that the artists get exactly what they ask for. So a marketplace is going to have the percentage on top of what you ask for. So whatever is the price that you believe that your artwork is worth is the price you're going to get. Wow, that was a great session. Um, I uh, enjoyed talking about it. This is the first time you talked about it uh, publicly. And I think we'll have to do more of these sessions. And uh, hopefully more a lot of people will see this video and uh, can't wait to remove the allow list and you know yeah. unleash <laughs> and let everyone uh, get get at it. But you know these things take time. They are a lot of work, uh, and to get it right takes takes some time. Um, so Daniel here has a question. Daniel says, "So those of us that have boosters, each booster gives a hundred vitru, yes, plus art, yes, plus credit, yes. That, <laughs> those boosters are." super packed uh you know very very useful useful things and uh um uh, we will enable a secondary market for them also so you know it's possible for you to sell those boosters also um so bami asked when i'm going to promote vitruvio on art schools what can i say when they can start i really do not want a date but two months or six or more it's a great question um one of the things we want to do, Bemi, is we want to have a structured process for onboarding folks that are not Web3 savvy. That that may be video, workshop, things like that, and really hand-holding. Uh, we want to have community ambassadors, et cetera, that are available to answer questions so you don't have to go off Googling and looking for you know, some resource that might be six months outdated for an, for an answer. So I think it's it's realistic to say at least six months because we'll first get through the backlog of existing Web three artists. For is that reasonable? Six six months? It's absolutely reasonable. I I do yeah. hope I do hope that it's even sooner. But we do have a lot of people already on our list to get onboarded, and we want to make sure that everything is running smooth with people that are already experienced on Web three before we open it up for people who are not yet experienced on a Web3. And that's why we have a mandatory uh, add your wallet in the beginning, because we have to make sure that you know you know what you're doing, the basics, you know. Cool. All right, it is time for me to grab some lunch because <laughs> I will otherwise get hangry. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I have a ton of other work to do also, but I, love, I loved uh, spending time here talking about this. But uh, thanks everyone. Uh, who was uh, watching us live and who will watch this later? We appreciate your time. Uh, you know, we build this for you, the creators, and uh, we hope uh, we have delivered on that front. Uh, you know, uh, we know it's not perfect. We know there's bugs, etc. But we are committed to fixing them very rapidly. We have an excellent team in Brazil. They are top notch. Very, they care deeply about the quality of their work, and you can see it when you use it. So. Thank you all, and uh, thank you for, and uh, I hope you have a great weekend, every, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. See ya. Thanks.